Yara yeah, Koto. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar session to talk about the building code update for plumbing and drainage. My name is Devin Glennie, and I am here at MB. I'm part of the team that helps uh, update the New Zealand building code. So this morning, we talked about some of our changes for protection for tire from fire. Now we're going to talk about documents we published last week for plumbing and drainage. Uh, these webinars are being recorded, so they will be available on our website uh, in a few days. And we have taken a few questions before the webinar started, so we'll be trying to answer those. There's other questions you can enter into the Q&A function here on Zoom, and we will try to answer some of the short ones in text. And if there's time, we'll get to some of the other questions as well. Uh, so we'll start into the background here. Sorry if you've seen this this morning. We're going to repeat a few things here for people who are new. Um, but just where we're at in the process, some of these changes have been in development for several years. We actually consulted on these in May 2022. There are over 100 submissions received across the different uh, topics in that consultation. After we analyzed and considered all that feedback, we announced the decisions in for lead and plumbing in November last year, and then the remaining topics earlier this year in May. Uh, so the new documents from those that consultation, those decisions were all published online last week. So now that the documents have been published, we're entering a period here of implementation and monitoring and seeing how the changes are taking hold in the sector and what's the, how they're actually landing. So these updates are important for New Zealanders because the public expects that the building they live in and work in are safe, durable, warm, dry, healthy, and have a low impact on the environment. A uh, little slide here that you may have seen before on the building code triangle. So this just shows the hierarchy here of legislation in New Zealand. At the top is the Building Act. It sets out the rules that all buildings must meet. And it's the primary legislation for building construction um, in New Zealand. So this is enacted through Parliament and it's a mandatory set of requirements. Uh, the building code sits below that in regulations, specifically Schedule 1 of the Building Regulations 1992. Uh, but when most people talk, talk about the building code, they think of the system, which is the regulations, as well as the acceptable solutions, verification methods, and standards and guidance that help support some of those compliance pathways. Uh, so today we'll be primarily talking about updates to the acceptable solutions and verification methods. However, there's a lot of details that are actually cited in the standards, and we'll be covering some of those as well where relevant. So we'll be talking about some of the standards we've revised and, and how that affects plumbing and drainage compliance. Uh, so the first question we received, or a very popular one from before, in our webinar signups, was when do the changes take effect? Uh, so the new documents were published last week, which means that they can be used to demonstrate compliance uh, today. Uh, but there is a transition period which allows you to use the previous documents for the next year. So at the end of the transition period, all the old documents can no longer be used. And during that transition period, both documents can be used to show compliance. So the documents were published on the 2nd of November, and so they can be used again until 1st of November 2024. Uh, there's one additional transition period around the lead and plumbing products, but we're going to talk about that specifically in that section of the webinar. One last thing before we get into the rest of our plumbing and drainage topics is a reminder about our building product information requirements. Uh, these regulations commence on the 11th of December this year, and these apply to all products manufactured into New Zealand, in, manufactured or imported into New Zealand on or after that date. So the regulations set out the minimum information that has to be presented for those products. It includes the things like the description of a product, its intended use, and installation and maintenance requirements. Uh, most importantly, it also includes information about how uh, what code clauses are relevant for the building product and how it might be expected to contribute to building code compliance. Uh, we've had several webinars and events already for what this means for the manufacturers, the importers, and the retailers. Uh, but there's also benefits for those who are designers or plumbers or building consent officers. Uh, the information provides a minimum level for all building products. Everyone is, gets to see the same information about the different uh, product types. And this allows better access to that information. It can also be used to help uh, support consent applications 
or making decisions around the use and approval of the products. And it can be helped to support alternative solutions as the information doesn't have to refer to uh, acceptable solutions of verification methods. It could refer to other ways to demonstrate compliance with the building code uh, through alternative solutions or standard cited overseas. Uh, so, so oh, there we go. My slides are changing on me. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, three different parts of the building code today uh, focused around plumbing and drainage. This is E1 surface water, G12 water supplies, and G13 flow, uh, foul water. When we consulted on these topics last year, there was, uh, was about seven different topics that we broke these down into. Uh, we asked people when signing up for the webinar which they were most interested in. Uh, a large number of responses were around the ASNZS 3500 standards, so we're going to spend some time on those. And also the backflow or the protection of potable water supplies. We'll talk about that and focus on that, as well as the water temperatures proposed, or topic. So those are the things we'll be going into the most detail in, but we're also going to try and cover some of these other things as well. I'm now going to introduce uh, Ross Wakefield, who's going to talk about the details of the changes. Uh, Ross is a senior advisor for plumbing and hydraulic services in our building and performance engineering team. He's a certifying plumber, gas fitter, and drain layer. And since putting away the tools, he's worked as a council plumbing inspector, an industry training assessor, and a hydraulic service design consultant. Uh, welcome, Ross. Yeah, thanks, Devin. And thank you all for joining us today to learn more about the plumbing and drainage building code updates. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, the first topic we had was lead in plumbing products. Uh, can you tell us uh, where lead is used and why lead is used in pl plumbing products? Yes, well, the use of lead in the manufacture of plumbing products has been common practice for many centuries. It's most commonly found in copper alloys, such as brass, where a small amount of lead is added to provide malleability when it's machined. Now, copper alloys are frequently used as components of plumbing products. Um, and lead's long been recognised as a cumulative toxin, and people can be exposed to it from ingestion of airborne dust, foods through the soil, or even through drinking water. The World Health Organization recommends that all practical measures are taken to reduce the exposure to lead, including the use of low lead alloy fittings and new plumbing installations or repairs. Now, Australia has recently announced changes to limit the allowable level of lead in plumbing products, and there are existing lead-free plumbing product requirements in place in North America. Now, at the moment, lead's currently allowed in small amounts in the raw material used to manufacture some plumbing products in New Zealand, provided it doesn't contaminate the water. Now, while these existing products that comply with the building code are considered safe, health officials recommend that where exposure to lead can be reduced, it should be reduced. And reducing the allowable levels of lead further will contribute to protecting public health. Yeah, so just to reiterate that, the existing products uh, comply with the building code are safe, but the health officials, they recommended any time there's exposure to lead, we should reduce it where it should be reduced or where it could be reduced. Yes, yeah, that's correct. All right, so what is the change? What actually changed about the, the requirements here? Yeah, so from the 1st of September 2025, any product that contains copper alloy and is intended for use in contact with potable water for human consumption, that must have a maximum lead content of 0.25% to be deemed to comply with the building code. Now, this, this change applies to products such as copper alloy fittings, valves, taps, water heaters, water dispensers and water meters that are intended for contact with water for human consumption. Uh, products that are used exclusively for non-drinking water uses, such as manufacturing or industrial processing, irrigation or other uses where the water is not anticipated to be uh, consumed by people are excluded. And this part of the update also clarifies that copper alloy water supply system components must be desinkification resistant to minimize premature corrosion. Yeah, and this is what I mentioned earlier, where the transition date is actually in the acceptable solution. It talks about the requirements taking effect from the 1st of September, 2025. So in a year from now, you can use the new documents, but it will still have this requirement that doesn't enact for another year. Uh, so the limit is 0.25%. Why not just say that all products have to have 0.00% lead? Yes, this is something that we looked at in detail, and 0.25% and was the lowest maximum allowable level that could be reasonably be set for copper alloy plumbing products. 
Uh, raw materials may contain trace amounts of lead, so it's difficult to set a maximum allowable limit lower than this. And this limit's the same as the one being introduced in Australia and aligns with existing limits for plumbing products in North America. So this ensures there's no gap between requirements for these products on both sides of the Tasman and they'll be aligned with international markets. How does this affect uh, exist existing buildings and existing plumbing work? Yeah, well, from the 1st of September 2025, all the products used for new plumbing work will need to comply with uh, with the new requirements when using the acceptable solution to meet the building code. And that's regardless of if a building consent is required or not. Uh, this proposed change does not affect existing plumbing systems unless they're being altered or replaced. So existing plum, uh, products that are compliant uh, with the building code at the time they're installed do not need to be replaced. Um, talking about the products themselves, how might a manufacturer demonstrate that their products comply? Yeah, manufacturers can demonstrate their products comply um, by using the National Sanitation Foundation 372 standard. So this is an American national standard that we've referenced, which provides a standardized method for determining and verifying product compliance uh, to minimize lead contaminants in these products. And this standard serves as the basis to establish uh, compliance with the new G12 AS1 lead and plumbing product provision. And compliance with the standard can be demonstrated with a test report provided by an accredited test facility. And so how might somebody be able to identify that the product complies with the new lead and plumbing provisions? Hmm. Yeah, there, there are several ways in which products that comply with the new provision can be identified. As you mentioned earlier, Devin, the new building product information requirements are coming into effect on the 11th of December 2023. And these place ob obligations on um, New Zealand-based building product manufacturers or importers of products to state how their product complies with the building code. So this is one way you'll be able to have a look to see how these products comply. Um, there are also international product certification scheme markings that can indicate compliance with equivalent requirements in other jurisdictions. Now, these markings include the Australian lead-free watermark mark of conformity or lead-free certification marks from the American National Standards Institute accredited certification bodies. As mentioned in the previous uh, slide, there's also the test report that can be provided by an accredited test facility in accordance with the uh, NESF 372 standard. And that test report should verify that the product has a weighted average lead content of no more than 0.25%. And that's another way you can check if a product complies. Yeah, and this information here on this slide, this is actually available on our website. So we posted this last week as well under the G12 water supplies page. You can you can find a link there and, and read the same information. Uh, so we had a question before um, the webinar started. Um, what will be the phase out period for existing stock of brass plumbing products? Mm. Yes, well, as you mentioned, we announced this decision early. Um, we announced this decision in November last year. Uh, to provide manufacturers and suppliers as much time as possible um, to be aware that this change was coming and to give them time to make the necessary changes to support the availability of compliant products in New Zealand. And the change, as mentioned, comes into effect on the 1st of September 2025. So from that date, only products complying with the new uh, provision will be deemed to comply with the New Zealand Building Code. All right. So that wraps up our little bit about lead. We're going to move on to water temperatures. Um, what change was made to the water temperatures? Well, hot water supplies, they must be adequate to meet building users' needs um, while also keeping them safe. And the building code requires that hot water is provided to personal hygiene fixtures at a temperature that avoids the likelihood of scalding. Uh, acceptable solution G12 AS1 has been amended. Uh, to reduce the maximum temperature of hot water at the tap to reduce the risk of scalding injuries to New Zealanders. Now, the maximum allowable temperature of hot water used for personal hygiene has been reduced from 55 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius for most buildings. This change only applies to new plumbing fixtures used for personal hygiene, such as hand basins, baths and showers. And the maximum temperature does not apply to kitchen sinks or laundry tubs, as these are not considered sanitary fixtures used for personal hygiene. Now, while higher temperature hot water can be provided to kitchens and laundries, uh, testing has been done that shows the provision of 50 degrees C hot water to domestic kitchen sinks is adequate for the hand washing of dishes. We've also maintained the maximum hot water delivery temperature of 45 degrees Celsius for institutions such as schools, 
hospitals and care homes within G12 AS1. Um, additional temperature control devices have also been introduced to provide more ways for plumbers to limit the temperature of hot water delivered to sanitary fixtures. And I just wanted to highlight again that this changes about the hot water delivery temperature. Um, the building code requires that hot water systems are able to be controlled to prevent the growth of Legionella bacteria, which is usually achieved by storing heated water at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius or higher. So this change does not affect the minimum temperature for hot water storage set by G12 AS1, which is 60 degrees Celsius, um, and that's set to limit the, the risk of Legionella bacteria growth, as mentioned. Can you just explain that again? What's the difference between the storage temperature and the delivery temperature? Mm -hmm. So the temperature of stored water within your hot water cylinder, for example, should be 60 degrees Celsius or higher. But the water delivered to a tap is for personal hygiene um, should be automatically reduced through a temperature control device such as a tempering valve before being delivered to the tap used for personal hygiene. Um, so can you tell us why this reduction in temperature is in What was some of the background? Yeah, the, the Burns Registry of Australia and New Zealand, they led a study into people with tap water scolds emitted to um, Australian and New Zealand burn centres between 2010 and 2019. And the graph shown on screen shows the number of people admitted to hospital from tap water scold burns during this period, broken down by age groups. The study found 130 people with tap water scolds were admitted to New Zealand burn centres during this period, and 65% of the severe tap water scolds were, occurred in infants and young children under the age of four years old. And over 90% of these burns occurred in the bathroom while bathing. Now, one thing that's important to note that the data shown in this graph only includes severe tap water scolds where patients were admitted to hospital burns units for treatment. These numbers do not account for the many tap water scolds that are treated by first aid at home or by a general practitioner or hospital emergency department. Yeah, so in summary, this research showed that the children were most at risk of these tap water scalds. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and so how can we actually reduce the risk of scalding? Well, on this slide, the, the graph on the right-hand side produced by the Building Research Association of New Zealand shows the time of exposure and water temperature at which full thickness scalds can occur. Now, as you can see, at 55 degrees Celsius, the time it takes for a child to get a full thickness scald burn is 10 seconds. At 55 degrees Celsius, again, it only takes about four seconds for a child to get a second degree burn. Now, when the temperature of water is reduced to 50 degrees Celsius, the time it takes for a child to get burnt increases to one minute. And for adults, the time it takes to get scalded increases from about 30 seconds to around five minutes. And at temperatures below 50 degrees Celsius, the likelihood of scalding continues to decrease. Now, it's important to note that these changes around the temperature reduction um, are not retrospective. That is, they only apply to the temperature of hot water delivered to new sanitary fixtures used for personal hygiene. Yeah, so that tiny bit of temperature difference, five degrees actually significantly increases or decreases the risk from that scalding for those children. Uh, so we talked about some of the new temperature control devices, or you briefly mentioned it. What are some of the new ways uh, that you can limit the hot water delivery temperature? Yeah, so the temperature of hot water delivered to taps is generally limited using a temperature control device, such as a tempering valve or a thermostatic mixing valve. And additional devices for limiting hot water temperature delivered to sanitary fixtures uh, used for personal hygiene have been provided in new tables within G12 AS1 and table 8A and 8B. Um, one key change to note with these tables is that those institutions with persons that are at greatest risk from scalding that have a maximum hot water delivery temperature of 45 degrees Celsius, such as schools or hospitals or care homes, they require thermostatic mixing valves or thermostatic tapware to be provided. Uh, these tables also clarify that each thermostatic mixing valve or tempering valve must have a non-return valve fitted to the hot and cold water supply. Um, and these devices may be fitted separately or form an integral part of the, the valve itself. And just to highlight that these temperature control devices uh, should only be installed or adjusted by authorised plumbers. Yeah, so it's not up to somebody who's a homeowner to go and adjust the temperatures themselves. They actually need to get a plumber involved. Uh, and make sure that that storage temperature is still being kept at the 60 degrees while the delivery temperature is the only thing affected. All right.
we're going to talk a little bit more about backflow protection or protection of potable water supplies. Uh, what did what did we do here? What what changes did we make? Yeah, so we've improved some of the requirements to protect drinking water from backflow contamination. Our backflow occurs when the flow of water in a pipe is reversed, which can draw contaminants into a potable water supply. And this can create a health risk to occupants in buildings and to entire public water supply systems. So changes um, to the acceptable solution G12AS1 within Section 3, which is for uh, the protection of potable water, have included providing more clarity around when backflow prevention is required, what type of backflow prevention devices are suitable, and how these devices should be installed and tested. Some of the key changes include providing additional cross-connection hazard rating examples, introducing containment backflow protection provisions to provide additional protection for water supplies, updating some of the backflow prevention device installation requirements, amending provisions for hose taps and hose connection and vacuum breakers, We've also cited the Australian New Zealand standard 3500 part one water supplies um, in the new acceptable solution G12 AS3, which brings in the cross connection control and backflow prevention provisions within that standard. And we've made a number of supporting protection of potable water changes throughout the acceptable solution. We'll cover these in a bit more detail in the next few slides. All right, let's start with some of those new cross connection hazard uh, rating examples. Can you tell us uh, some of the ones that have changed or what, what these are about? Uh, acceptable solution G12 AS1 describes three cross-connection hazard rating categories, which are high, medium, and low. And it provides examples of various building systems which fall into each category. So as part of this update, uh, the following additional cross-connection hazard rating examples have been included, which are the ones that you can see on screen. Um, for high hazard examples, we've included the likes of B-days and douche seats, um, hose taps associated with soil waste dump points. Uh, for medium hazard, we've included an example of treated grey water. Uh, point to note here, we've added a, an exemption to the existing medium hazard example for swimming pools, spas and fountains, which excludes those filled by hose taps in conjunction with household units. And this will support the, um, the provision of hose connection vacuum breakers as acceptable backflow prevention devices for filling uh, spa pools and pools at home, which we'll cover a bit more in the next slide. Um, and for low cross-connection hazards, we've added in, in two new examples, one for drinking fountains and bottle fillers and one for hose taps, other than those associated with medium or high hazard situations. And so how do these backflow protection provisions, how do they relate to uh, requirements from an individual council or for a water supplier? Yes, well, we've introduced new provisions for containment backflow protection to be provided, um, a new premises that pose a heightened risk of water supply contamination if a cross connection was to occur. Um, now, containment backflow protection is also known as boundary backflow protection. Um, and this has been defined as backflow protection installed adjacent to the point of supply to a property to protect a water main from any potential contamination risk posed by backflow from a premises. So these new provisions that we've introduced, they only apply in situations where containment backflow protection is not provided by the water supplier. And additionally, they don't apply to premises containing only household units. Uh, where containment device is provided, um, water downstream of this device is considered to be potable unless there are unprotected hazards within the premises. And individual backflow prevention devices within buildings are still required to be provided upstream of fixtures or equipment that poses a cross-connection hazard. And this is to prevent the contamination of the water supply within the property. The image shown on screen that illustrates the point of supply. Uh, so the backflow prevention device is installed downstream of the point of supply, which is indicated by the red dash line. They must be installed by an authorised plumber. And backflow prevention devices installed upstream of the point of supply are the responsibility of the water supply. All right. Has there anything else been added to the acceptable solution as part of these containment uh, new containment provisions? Yes, a new table has been added, table 2A, which is shown in part on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, and this lists premises that require containment backflow protection and the type of protection required. Now, like other automatic backflow prevention devices, a containment backflow prevention device that's installed downstream of the point of supply 
by a plumber also needs to be included on the building's compliance schedule. And these devices require annual testing by an independently qualified person as part of the process for issuing an annual building warrant of fitness. The exception to this is air gaps, which are not required to be included on a compliance schedule. Yeah, I think we had that question come in before the webinar. Do you put air on the compliance schedule? The answer is no, it does not appear with the air gap. Uh, so if you look at the device installation, uh, can you tell me about this and what we updated? Yeah, so the backflow prevention device installation requirements within G12 AS1 have had a few updates to clarify that devices much, must be attached only after the pipework has been flushed. They must be fitted with connections which allow for the easy removal and replacement of the device. The devices must be adequately supported and installed with isolation valves in order to allow the independently qualified persons to test these devices annually. And that reduced pressure zone devices must be installed with adequate drainage provisions where they're installed inside a building. We've also provided some commentary around what constitutes an accessible position for a backflow prevention device to be installed. And this clarification is intended to reduce the likelihood of devices being installed in locations that may compromise the health and safety of the independently qualified persons who are required to test these devices annually. Okay, and we also talked about the hose taps earlier in the hazard examples. Uh, what have we changed there? Yeah, so the provisions within G12 AS1 for hose taps and hose connection vacuum breakers have been updated. Now, these updates clarify, as I mentioned before, that hose taps, other than those associated with a medium or high hazard, are considered to pose a low cross-connection hazard. And that hose taps connected to the potable water supply require backflow protection. And the minimum acceptable type of backflow pro protection device is a permanently attached hose connection vacuum breaker. Now, hose connection vacuum breakers are only suitable for low cross-connection hazards, as mentioned, and protection against back siphonage. And these these devices can be tested in accordance with the method outlined in the 2019 New Zealand Backflow Testing Standard. And we've also included some installation requirements, um, which are relatively straightforward for hose connection vacuum breakers uh, within G12 AS1. You briefly mentioned it as well that the AS NZS 3500.1 has backflow prevention provisions. How does this relate to the changes in that standard or in, how does it relate to the standard? Yeah, so as, as part of the updates that um, have been published to the Acceptable Solutions, the latest 2021 versions of the ASNZS 3500 standards have been cited, and I'll discuss that in a bit more detail shortly. But as part of citing the latest versions of these standards, the cross-connection control and backflow prevention provisions included in ASNZS 3500 Part 1 2021 have been included as another means of complying with the building code. And these form part of the, a new acceptable solution, which is acceptable solution G12 AS3. Um, within 3500 part one, 2021, section four specifies requirements and methods for the prevention of contamination, drinking water and the water service, um, and provides for the selection and installation of backflow prevention devices. So there are a number of changes made which better aligned requirements within this section of the standard and the existing G12 AS1 provisions for backflow prevention and cross-connection control. And citing this section of the standard within the new acceptable solutions gives them more options for designers and plumbers to consider when they're selecting backflow prevention devices. So does the standard contain its own uh, examples of cross-connection hazard ratings? Yes, yeah, so an important point to note is that in the recent amendment to 3500 part one in the 2021 edition, that included withdrawing the cross-connection hazard rating examples that were in the standard from Appendix F, so that there's no duplication or inconsistencies with those included in Acceptable Solution G12 AS1 or in Australia, the Plumbing Code of Australia. So it's an important point to note that when you use the section of 3500 part one um, for backflow prevention selection, you'll need to refer to G12 AS1 for the cross-connection hazard ratings for consistency. Okay, and just briefly talk about some of these other uh, standards that are cited. What else have been changed to support the backflow protection? Yeah, a couple of the other changes to support um, these updates include citing the latest backflow prevention device testing and manufacturing standards, and we've provided some new or updated definitions which support these changes. And what changes did we make to the pipeline identification? 
Yeah, so water supply pipe work systems, they need to be clearly identifiable to reduce the risk of plumbers misidentifying pipe work and cross connections occurring. Um, cross connections between potable and non potable water supply pipe work can result in water supply contamination. And previous versions of G12 AS1 referenced an older standard, NZS 5807, as a means of identifying potable and non potable pipelines within buildings. The standard lacks sufficient clarity regarding the identification requirements for the marking of water supply pipe work within buildings, and the reference to the standards now been withdrawn. So we've replaced that with some updated provisions um, around the around pipeline identification to reduce the risk of cross connection. Um, these changes include when non-potable water supply pipe work is reticulated around a building, that all of that non-potable water supply pipe work shall be lilac coloured or made readily identifiable using permanent identification markings. And where a non-potable water supply is reticulated around a building other than a household unit, the potable water supply pipe work shall also be made readily identifiable as containing potable water. And there's also provisions for where permanent identification markings are used instead of the lilac colouring. Um, for where these markings should be placed. And these changes closely align with changes made in the 2021 edition of ASNZS 3500 Part 1 for water services. All right. So quite a bit of alignment there between the acceptable solution as well as the standard and making sure that they're both um, producing similar uh, results here. Uh, we've talked about the standard quite a bit now, so we'll, we'll actually go into it more detailed here. So ASNZS 3500, tell me about uh, these these standards or the standard series. Yeah, so the ASNZS 3500 series, plumbing and drainage standards, they play an integral part in setting out the design and installation requirements for plumbing and drainage systems, both in New Zealand and in Australia. Uh, these standards can be applied to new installations as well as alterations, additions and repairs to existing installations. They specify the requirements for the materials, design and installation of water services, sanitary services, stormwater drainage, and heated water services. In the next few slides, I'll talk through some of the changes that were made in the 2021 editions of the ASNZS 3500 standards and where these are cited under the building code. And, and one of those citations is actually issuing a new acceptable solution to cite the standard. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I'll talk a bit about that in the next slide um, and the new acceptable solution that's been issued. All right. So, how are these built? Uh, how are these standards cited then across uh, E1, G12, and G13? Yeah. So, under G12, one of the key changes is that we've cited ASNZS 3500 2021 Parts 1 for water services and Part 4 for heated water services under a new acceptable solution, and that's G12 AS3. Now, these were previously cited in verification method G12 VM1 in part. However, citing these under a new acceptable solution will provide consistency between the status of these standards under the building code. Now, we've also cited uh, the majority of ASNZS 3500 part one as an acceptable solution, where previously only two sections and one appendix for the standard was cited. The G13 foul water, um, ASNZS 3500 part two, the 2021 edition still remains referenced under G13 AS3 and ASNZS 3500 Part 3 stormwater drainage is cited under E1 AS2. Now it's important to refer to the um, acceptable solutions that reference the 3500 standards because there's a number of New Zealand specific modifications to these standards made um, and the modifications that have been made to these standards have been reduced as part of this update as a number of New Zealand specific requirements have been embedded directly within these standards. Yeah, so if you're looking to use these standards, you can find them as cited in the acceptable solution, but in some cases they do have modifications to be fit for the New Zealand building code that pay attention to. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about the standards and some of the changes that were made. Yeah, I'll talk over those in the next few slides, some of the changes that were made in the 2021 editions. Uh, there were some changes made to the definitions for terminology used in the series and the defined terms within parts one, two, three, and four were relocated and consolidated in part zero, which is the glossary of terms. And this provides um, definitions across the, the series. These definitions were reviewed in light of new technologies and practices and they were also updated. Uh, there was some changes to specific product standard requirements. 
um, a number of the product standard references were removed to avoid inconsistencies with the Watermark Product Certification Scheme in Australia. Um, now, there's, the reason for that is the product standards referenced within the ASNZS 3500 series may not be the same specifications as accepted under the Watermark Scheme, and it was creating some challenges. Um, one example could be the ASNZS 3500 may have previously referenced one manufacturing standard for a product. However, to be certified under the Watermark Scheme, the product would need to have been manufactured and certified for compliance to a different document. Um, and new product and materials appendices have been added within 3500 parts one, two, and four um, to aid in determining if plumbing and drainage products and materials are fit for purpose for use in systems. Uh, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, there have been a number of backflow prevention updates made within 3500 part one, which better align requirements with the G12 AS1 backflow prevention and cross-connection control provisions. And some of those included the cross-connection hazard ratings for atmospheric vacuum breakers, pressure vacuum breakers, and air gaps being amended to align with G12 AS1, which made it easier for us to cite this section of the standard. All right, so tell me some of the changes here in uh, parts two and part three of the standard. Yeah, so there's been some changes made to the range of materials that can be used for foul water and stormwater wet wells. They've been expanded to encompass prefabricated wells, including those manufactured from high-density polyethylene and polypropylene and PVC. There's also been some changes to the venting requirements in ASNGS 3500 Part 2 for air admittance valves and pressure attenuators. Um, with regards to the air admittance valve changes, they're relatively minor and they're aimed at reducing any chance of non-compliant installations. The pressure attenuators was a bigger change and will enable more flexible and efficient application for the installation of these types of systems in multi-storey developments. Uh, there was also changes regarding penetrations and steel frames uh, for water supply pipe work. Um, these were updated to be consistent with the National Association of Steel Housing steel, um, steel Framing Standards. And they specify the provision of service holes and metal framework, which includes the size, number, and placement of holes. Yeah, and there were still some uh, other changes. Tell me about the jointing methods. Yeah, so there were some changes to the jointing methods for plastic pipes in ASNZS 3500 Part 1. And they were clarified and expanded to allow different methods. And they really just reflect what should be occurring in practice at the moment. Um, there was a, a change to the minimum separation distance between above ground heated water services and electrical services um, in 3500 part four. And this reduced the clearance from 100 millimetres down to 25 millimetres to align with the wiring rules. And there was also some changes to the requirements for the marking of pipes in commercial buildings to assist in the better identification of pipe work and avoid cross connections, very similar to the changes to G12 as one that I mentioned for pipeline identification. And there's some changes to the jointing or the rainfall intensities as well. Mm. Yes, yeah, so in ASNZS 3500 part three, the stormwater drainage systems, the design rainfall intensities um, for New Zealand were updated to show the latest values from the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research. And they also changed how they're expressed. They're now expressed in terms of an annual exceedance probability to align with the performance requirements of the building code. And that's the probability that a given rainfall total accumulated over a given duration will be exceeded in any one year. There were also changes made to part four for heated water systems, specifically around circulatory systems. So this included changes around the location of water meters and entry points for heated water connections to individual units within buildings that have circulatory heated water systems and include insula uh, insulation provisions uh, for non-circulatory heated water piping branches from these, as well as recommending a maximum capacity of two litres for any dead leg from the branch to the outlet. These changes aim to improve the amenity for users um, in buildings with circulatory heated water systems and reduce wastage of water and energy. Uh, there were also um, the heated water delivery temperature control provisions within 3500 part four. Now they were withdrawn. And so there was no duplication between the provisions in that standard 
and what's set in the acceptable solution G12 AS1, which is published by ENVI, or by the Plumbing Code of Australia. So that's the likes of the maximum delivery temperatures that we mentioned earlier and the delivery temperature control devices. If you're using ASNZ 3500 Part 4, you'd need a cross-reference G12 AS1 for those maximum hot water delivery temperatures. All right. So there's a lot of changes there. I guess if people want to see more, they can read about them on the Standards of New Zealand website, read the standards directly. They are available for uh, download there. Uh, we're going to move on into some of our water system supply component changes, uh, starting off with expansion vessels. Uh, can you tell me about expansion vessels? Yeah, so expansion vessels, they've been introduced into acceptable solution G12 AS1 as a low-cost, simple-to-install alternative to expansion control valves, the mains pressure storage water heating systems. So cold water expands when it's heated, and because storage water heating systems are fitted with a non-return valve on the cold water supply, this prevents the expansion forcing back into the water supply. So there needs to be some other mechanism in the system to prevent water heaters or other components from rupturing. The status quo is uh, the provision of an expansion control valve or a cold water expansion valve, but expansion vessels are a new option that can be used um, under this acceptable solution. And some of the benefits of installing an expansion vessel as an alternative to an expansion control valve include the potable water savings of around five litres per day, more stabilised pressures within the hot water system, and it also reduces the need for a drain that you'd require from an expansion control valve. So how do you actually determine the size of an expansion vessel needed? Yeah, so a new section covering the installation, sizing and commissioning of expansion vessels has been included in G12 AS1. And in this section, there's um, a calculation method that you can use to calculate the size of an expansion vessel. And there's also an example table to help with selecting the correct size expansion vessel to match the storage water heater. Yeah, and so people can go and read that in the new G12 AS1. Uh, we also have uh, changes made to the seismic restraint of water heaters. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so the, the previous detail for seismic seismically restraining storage water heaters um, required straps to be provided no further than 100 millimetres from the top and the bottom of the storage water heater. Uh, so this created some challenges with the straps clashing with pipework connections and cylinder controls. So we've added some new notes below the figure within G12 AS1, figure 14 that's shown on screen, um, which provide alternative options for the seismic restraint straps to be located within the top and bottom 25% of the cylinder. Now, where this is done, you need to provide an additional step centrally for cylinders up to 200 litres or two additional evenly spaced straps for cylinders over 200 litres. Um, now, an additional strap placed centrally is also required where a cylinder is located more than 12 metres above ground uh, or, say, on the fourth storey or above in a multi-level building as the upper levels of a tall building can experience higher uh, seismic forces in an earthquake. And a maximum total of four straps are required in any situation when complying with these new provisions. And just to reiterate, the seismic restraint for cylinders are over 360 litres are outside the scope of this acceptable solution in detail, and they may require specific design. All right. So some options there for some more flexibility for those straps. Um, can you tell me some of the other changes made in G12 AS1 here? Yeah, We've made some updates to specify that pipework insulation material exposed to direct sunlight must be UV resistant or suitably protected to withstand uh, degradation. Um, we've also made some uh, updates to pipework system insulation standards. So water supply systems can be constructed from various types of materials. And to assist plumbers with ensuring the systems are installed correctly, we've cited suitable installation standards for UPVC pipework, copper and polyethylene pipework within G12 AS1. Um, and to assist with ensuring that building water supplies are not installed with inadequate or excessive water pressures, minimum and maximum water pressure requirements at sanitary fixes and appliances have been introduced within G12 AS1. Now it's important with these, um, particularly with the minimum requirements, which align with low pressure systems, that you refer to manufacturer's information for the minimum and maximum pressures for particular valves or components of these systems. Now, maximum pressures were not previously specified in G12 AS1, 
but the pressure that's been introduced align with equivalent requirements in the ASNGS 3500 series. All right, and so we had some other changes as well. Still, we, we looked at unintentional heating of cold water. Can you tell us about that? Hmm. Yeah, so cold water within plumbing systems can become unintentionally heated if, for example, the cold water supply pipe work is run directly under a metal roof in a ceiling space. Now, there are potential health risks involved if hot water becomes unintentionally heated, including the risk of uh, bacterial growth within the pipe, or in extreme cases, scalding if the water gets very hot. Um, now, so G12 AS1 has been updated to require water supply systems to be installed in a manner that avoids unintentional heating of cold water. So consideration should be given to avoiding long runs of pipe work in locations exposed to solar um, heat gain. Or locating pipe work within ceiling spaces under any insulating material uh, laid for restricting heat losses through ceilings or insulating the pipe work itself in certain situations. Um, we've also made some updates regarding wet back water heaters. So wet back water heating systems, they utilize heat generated from a solid fuel heater to heat water for domestic use. Now, previously, G12 AS1 provided a limited amount of information regarding wet back water heating systems. And some additional detail was required to ensure these systems are installed safely. So the acceptable solution has been updated to site part four of NZS 4603, which is an older standard that provides more comprehensive provisions for designing and installing wet back water heating systems that utilize natural circulation. Now this standard, NZS 4603, can be accessed from Standards New Zealand website at no cost, um, as access to view and print the standards currently sponsored by MB. We've also made a few updates regarding accessible taps. So previously only single lever or separate hot and cold capstan handle taps were permitted to be installed uh, where they were used by people with disabilities when complying with G12 AS1. So this section's now been updated to include sensor taps that activate automatically when hands are placed under them. And sensor taps are particularly suitable for use by people with disabilities, particularly where a person may have limited hand function. And separate hot and cold capstan handle taps are also no longer installed in facilities used by people with disabilities. So these have been removed as an acceptable option. All right. And what can you tell me about the re relief valve drain discard discharge locations? Yes, yeah, so storage water heater relief valves require drains to convey water to an appropriate location when these valves open. And we've included some examples of acceptable relief valve drain discharge locations in G12 AS1. Um, we've also made some changes regarding the uh, minimum cover of water supply pipe work uh, below non trafficable areas. Uh, so it's been updated to reduce the maximum cover from 450 millimetres to 300 millimetres, uh, where water supply pipes are installed below gardens or lawns or other areas not subjected to vehicular traffic. Um, and this aligns with the minimum water supply pipework cover requirements for non trafficable areas in ASNZS 3500 part one. We've also introduced some provisions regarding the flushing of water supply pipework after installation or alteration. Now these flushing provisions often occur in practice and we've just clarified that it's needed to um, clear the system of any dirt, swarf or any debris that may interfere with system components or contaminate the water. Okay, and so to round out this section on water system supply components, the last thing we'll talk about is the revised verification method G12VM1. It has a, a method there to determine the size of pipe work. What can you tell me about the new VM? Yeah, so we've updated verification method G12VM1 uh, to provide a means of establishing um, maximum flow rates for use in sizing hot water and cold water supply systems for use by plumbing system designers. So this verification method, G12VM1, it previously cited the pipe sizing provisions within the 2018 and earlier versions of ASNZS 3500 Part 1 water services. Um, and the method for sizing water supply pipe work within the ASNZS 3500 standards is limited in scope, being applicable to residential buildings only. So to assist with providing a compliance pathway that assisted with sizing pipe work for other types of buildings, this new method has been introduced into G12VM1. Now, the application of the loading unit method reference in this verification method to the sizing of hot and cold water services requires the application of specialist knowledge, experience, and judgment. And plumbing system designers 
if they choose, they can continue to apply other flow rate calculation methods if they use them as alternative solutions to complying with G12 AS1, uh, G12 if they choose. Yeah, and those standards, the existing standards cited, they're now part of the new acceptable solution, G12 AS3. Yes, yes. The ASNZ 3500 parts one and four are now form part of that acceptable solution. They've been relocated from this verification method. All right, so we're getting close to the end. Uh, topic number six, we revised over 40 standards on uh, material standards. Can you give me mm -hmm. a brief summary with important points for these? Yeah, so as part of this update, we've referenced over 40 new or amended manufacturing or testing standards for plumbing and drainage system components, and that's across the acceptable solutions for complying with E1, G12, and G13. These changes form part of regular maintenance updates by large to address outdated product manufacturing standard citations. Because some of the key points include the inclusion of additional acceptable materials for sanitary plumbing and drainage systems within the relevant um, materials tables. It also involved the removal of galvanized steel as an acceptable material for hot and cold water pipework systems. It included the citation of the latest 2018 version of the plumbing product testing standard ASNZS 4020 and the standards used to determine the suitability of products for use in contact with drinking water. And we've also included informative comments indicating that products certified under the Australian Watermark Certification Scheme, they may be verified as satisfying the relevant performance requirements of the New Zealand Building Code. All right, and so most of our webinar today talked about G12 AS1, a lot of the changes made there. Can you just remind me of the changes made in G13? Yeah, so we've made a few updates to the acceptable solutions for complying with G13 foul water. These are predominantly to ensure consistency of key industry practices between the acceptable solutions and provisions with ASNZS 3500 part two for sanitary plumbing and drainage. So some of these consistency alignments include the addition of incline junction provisions within acceptable solutions G13AS1 and G13AS2. Now this improves consistency with the provisions introduced into G13AS3 as part of the 2020 building code update. One of the other changes is reducing the minimum gully height above an unpaved ground level in G13AS2 from 100 millimetres down to 75 millimetres. This is to align with the equivalent provision in ASNZS 3500 Part 2, which is cited in G13AS3. And remind me about the changes made to E1 as well? Yeah, we've made a few updates to the acceptable solutions for complying with E1 surface water. Uh, as mentioned, this includes citing the new version of ASNZS 3500 Part 3 2021 stormwater drainage is an acceptable solution and we removed a number of redundant modifications to the standard that were previously found in this acceptable solution as they are no longer necessary. Um, we've also cited new material standards an acceptable solution E1 AS1 for surface water drainage system components and we've provided a calculation um, example for the catchment area for type 1 and 2 sumps in E1 AS1. All right, so that brings us to the end. We do have time for questions. We're right on time here. I just haven't loaded up what these are. I'm gonna take a scroll through and try and find some. Uh, when you're lodging a building consent and you're looking at the requirements for new taps to contain uh, low levels of lead, do you expect that this would be provided, this information would be provided in a consent application? like of the certificate or uh, some other specification? It'd be expected that this information would be contained on the um, building product information provided by the, the manufacturer or the importer of the product. So it should be clearly stated on there. And, and if it was asked for, um, then the manufacturer or the importer should be able to provide a copy of the, the test report uh, demonstrating verification. And are there accredited test facilities here in New Zealand to determine that uh, low level of lead? Yeah, there, there are a couple of test facilities that are currently um, seeking accreditation, I believe, and, and have the ability to test products in this manner. But the, the challenge is we've referenced a new standard, um, the North American standard. And so there's a process to go through where they would need to seek accreditation. So at this stage, I don't believe there's anyone that has yet become accredited in New Zealand, though some are looking, and there are accredited test facilities now available in Australia and likewise in other locations around the world. 
Um, some questions here about the hot water temperatures. Uh, some background on the research. Uh, did it consider if it was untempered or tempered supplies uh, associated with the scald? Yeah, so the, the research from the, the graph that I showed from the Burns Research um, Association of Australia and New Zealand, that looked at data that was collected from Burns units. Um, and that data was quite detailed, although it wasn't consistently able to tell you what the delivery temperature of the hot water was. So, um, yes, it's, it wasn't able to be clear enough what was tempered and what was untempered, but it clearly showed that there was a high level of scold still occurring and where the risk lied, um, predominantly in younger children and predominantly at risk from scolds from bathing or in bathrooms, um, which is why we did some further research and had a look into what the impacts of reducing the temperature by five degrees would be from a practical perspective from the risk of scalding. And can a plumber adjust the temperature of existing existing tempering valves? Uh, yes, plumbers can adjust the temperature of existing tempering valves, but uh, this shouldn't be done by homeowners or someone that's not an authorised plumber. Uh, there's one here about uh, ASNZS 3500. It may be more detailed than you can answer, but I'll ask it anyways. Uh, within point one or part, part one and part four in G12 is section 425 uh, on backflow prevention acceptable in G12. 425 of 3500.1. Yeah, so we've included a modification to the referencing of ASNZS 3500 part one. There's only two, and one of them is to exclude... Um, the referencing of that section and that section is a very broad section around the use of integral backflow prevention devices within appliances and um and other equipment and that was excluded because there's some challenges with how those are, are then verified and how they would meet requirements under the building act for the compliance schedule regime and he would check um these integral backflow prevention devices were performing and how they met the required hazard ratings Okay, switching to some of the backflow questions here. Uh, with the new backflow requirements, does this extend to irrigation cross connections where chem check valves were previously used? Uh, no, they don't apply where where a, a, for solely uh, an irrigation installation. It only applies uh, to new building work to water supplies that would be connected to serve um, sanitary fixtures or sanitary appliances. Um, um, do the backflow prevention apply to rural properties or self-supplied water tank systems? Yes, yes, that would apply to rural properties and self-supplied water tank systems. Uh Will all new hose taps installed, even if a replacement of an existing hose tap, require a vacuum breaker to be attached? Yes, yeah, so a minimum level of um, backflow prevention where a hose tap isn't associated with a specific hazard should be a hose connection vacuum breaker fitted to new hose taps. By with G12S. <clears throat> There's some questions here about the identification. Like what kind of uh, identification would be required for those non-potable water pipes, would stickers be adequate or what forms? Mm. Yes, stickers, as long as they're permanently affixed to the pipework, um, would be adequate. And there's some provisions within the acceptable solution, likewise within the um, ASNZS 3500 standards around where those stickers should be placed, the sort of spacing distances on pipe and where the pipework penetrates through walls or may um, branch through ceilings and the likes. So yeah. Stickers in adequate locations where the pipework isn't covered or where the pipework is insulated for some reason you couldn't tell um, that it was cover, um, colored can be used. Uh, another one here about sprinkler systems and backflow. Are backflow protection devices required to isolate the sprinkler system from the potable water supply? Yes. Well, yeah, all fire sprinkler systems should incorporate a backflow prevention device where they connect to the potable water supply. Uh, 
And then another clarification about backflow. How is, is it necessary for residential or not? Um, yes, the backflow prevention and cross-connection hazards need to be addressed within residential properties. The new containment back, backflow protection provisions that were introduced into G12A as one, they don't apply specifically to um, to single residential buildings. We'll switch here to some of the water system supply components. Um, expansion vessels, do they require maintenance such as yearly inspections or things like that? Um, they can over time, over a period of time, um, lose charge. They essentially just pressurize with air. They're a very simple system. Um, and so they can be repressurized if they do lose lose charge over time. And that can be easily checked if a plumber's on site um, and can can see if it's operating. Uh, if if it lost its full charge, uh, you'd get the hot water cylinder discharging water from the um, temperature pressure relief valve. Um, so that would be an indication that uh, maintenance would be required on the expansion vessel. Uh, someone's asked here a question about standards. Uh, under the Building Act, Section 25A, are standards required to be posted on MB's website as part of the acceptable solution? Uh, I can answer some of that. Uh, no, the answer is, is, is not required to be posted on our website. Um, they are incorporated into the content of the acceptable solution. There's other requirements under the Building Act about how standards are incorporated. And they we, we basically have, we advertise where they are available. And so you can go and look those up. Uh, as we discussed earlier this morning in the fire presentation, there are standards that we cite and sponsor through Standards New Zealand, but in some instances, we're unable to sponsor uh, free access to the standards, um, and that's because of international agreements or uh, copyright issues between those other standards. Uh, but the, the new standards, the AS NZS 3500, they are available on uh, the Standards New Zealand website. Um, somebody's asked about a hose vacuum breaker. Can you just go over again when that is required? Yeah, so under the updates to G12 AS1, um, for hose connection vacuum breakers, they'd be required uh, for hose taps where there's no uh, medium or high hazard directly associated with that hose tap. Um, so they've been classed as a, a low hazard Hose taps have been classed as providing a low, presenting a low hazard uh, where there's no specific hazard near it. That's just because it's uncontrolled. Um, people can hook a hose onto it and it could potentially become uh, submerged in a contaminant. So the provision of a hose connection vacuum breaker helps mitigate that risk uh, and they can be yeah, installed on new hose taps. Where the hose connection, where the hose taps associated with a higher hazard, if it's used specifically with, for example, the new um, High hazard example provided for uh, soil waste dump points where someone might be discharging foul water into a dump point and you have a hose tap there to clean it down, then that would be considered a high hazard and a, a high hazard device would be required with that hose tap. And does the vacuum breaker apply where there's no pool? That's just a follow up on that question as well. Uh, yes, yes. But for residential properties, a vacuum breaker would be sufficient protection against filling a residential pool or spa. Um, another question about the lead requirements. Uh, what, what, how does it apply to showers, baths, and things like laundry tubs? What components would have to be low lead? Yeah, so it wouldn't apply to showers or baths, shower mixes, or um, shower heads or bath spouts for example um in recognition that these are not fixtures that are typically used for the consumption of water um and that water usually isn't left sitting in a in it for a long period of time um, 
So those are some of the reasoning behind why those have been excluded. And that aligns with the equivalent requirements under the watermark uh, the lead-free certification regime. All right. Um, there's a couple of questions here that are very similar, but uh, they're asking about the 3,500 standards. Is it acceptable to mix and match or use portions of the standard and portions of the acceptable solution? Um, so if there was going to be a mix and match situation, that would need to be proposed to the Building Consent Authority as, as an alternative solution. Um, and and specific design considerations would need to be taken into account to make sure the system still met the performance requirements of the building code. Yeah, so uh, just to reiterate that, if you're picking an acceptable solution and it cites the standard, you're expected to comply with that fully. And if you if you can't, then it's an alternative solution. Um, just pick up on our last question there. Did we talk with the laundry tubs in our lead provisions? Did we Around laundry tubs? Yeah. Um, laundry tubs aren't specifically discussed in there, but if they incorporate a tap that could be likewise utilized on a, a kitchen sink, if, if it's a laundry tub, it's a bench mounted tap, then that tap would need to comply with those provisions. Um, a couple of questions coming in if the webinar is going to be posted. And yes, it will be posted. The recording will be posted. Um, in a few days, uh, it takes a little bit of time to get it all configured and put up online. Uh, so it will be available. Uh, I'm not seeing more questions come in. There's a few that I may have missed, but if we have missed them, we will try and address them after the webinar. And if there's answers that we can provide, we can we can do that. Um, unless we get anything else we may end it here yeah well thank, thanks everyone for dialing in to listening to the webinar today and, and thanks to all those um, who provided comments and feedback uh, during the public consultation and the development of these proposed changes all right well thank you everybody uh there will be an email that goes out after the webinar to just wrap it up and we will try and provide links to the recordings and things like that when it's available uh, so for look for those on our website building.gov.nz um, thanks everyone for attending.